Welcome back to part two of our interview with Dr. Anders Eriksson, author of Peak, where we're discussing deliberate practice and specific self-assessment skills and tools that students can implement to start to implement purposeful practice and deliberate practice into their studies. There is a lot of great information, so I hope you enjoy the rest of this great interview with Dr. Anders Eriksson. Also, if you would like to directly interact with the podcast hosts of this show, as well as the other Inside the Boards Network shows, other board members, and other ITB community members, please join us on our Slack community channel. Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now... Here's your host, Chase DeMarco. And, and my own kind of vision is that if you're willing now to think out loud when you're trying to answer questions and videotape that, conceivably you could then edit and now send a package that is 10 episodes that you want an expert to actually give you feedback on, and that that would be a much more effective way, you know, assuming now that the person who's giving you advice has, you know, a higher salary and therefore you would need to minimize, you know, their time. And and I think when even when it comes to surgery, I've talked to residents who wanted to basically do this so that there's a tape recording. So instead of having, you know, their supervisor watch the whole thing, you know, you could pick out maybe a 30 second interval here and tell, okay, I was thinking this and this is what happened. You know, I did this, but, you know, would there be something else that I could have or should have noticed that would have allowed me now to uh, select something that would have an even better outcome? I'm a big advocate for medical students using some sort of journal to say, this is what I think is going to happen. Okay, this is what happened. Okay, this is why it happened. So that sort of self-assessment at least, and you can still use those notes if you have a tutor or something of that sort and bring that recorded log and keep yourself honest so you don't develop your own uh, confirmation bias thinking that you're doing better than you are. Would you recommend something like that as well? You know, I, I think that's great. And, and, and in fact, One thing that I'm really looking for is individuals willing to document their own process. So I sometimes draw the analogy here, you know, with Columbus or any kind of discoverer who went to this unknown country. And basically, uh, in order to really communicate to people who weren't able to make that journey, you basically had to document and write down all the things that you saw and and I don't see that there's a lot of journeys that actually would allow you to learn from somebody else's process. And I think that there might be ways here, especially when people, we have several descriptions, to now find things that are recurrent problems that may be a slightly different decision here early on might actually lead to much more successful outcome later on. But essentially building up now this knowledge here of the path to expertise or expert performance. Wow, I think that would be a great study. And you know, I was just thinking that we have at Inside the Boards a study skills book coming out and then hopefully this summer, if everything goes as planned, and perhaps we could work something in with that, such as a free PDF you can download or request students go to a certain website and sort of journal this material or send in the journal when they're exiting school and maybe collect a log that way. We could have a a new research project to work on. Well, you know, in some ways, I think people should be able to get credit for those kinds of documentations. And and I, I think now with YouTube and stuff like that, it's not, you know, like it just has to be verbal. You can actually document things with video. And and I know that there are people, especially in sports, who where parents actually are now documenting the changes by basically making sure now that the the child that they're you know helping will do the same thing because one of the problems is assessing here the differences so 
if you're doing totally different things at the two different times, it makes it much harder here to pinpoint, you know, what is the difference? So ideally, you would like to have some tasks that you basically would be able to do now multiple times. And then you can see how basically with different skill levels, you will be able to you know, perform these tasks in a different and hopefully better way with basically more training. Mm, but I find that it would be very difficult for a student to know how to set that up on their own. But if they had something they could just maybe go to a link and download, then maybe they'd use it and we could gather some information on that. I think it would be great to find out more about that and the entire medical community would probably benefit greatly from that type of research. Well, you know, I I think what you need is sort of maybe somebody with money who is willing to fund something like this. And the way I was thinking about it, that ideally you would like to have a video team maybe that is actually doing the documenting and then you have maybe, uh, you know, a faculty member who is kind of trying to design here the kind of tests that you would be doing and giving recommendations here as to how they should document whatever they do that's relevant now to improving the performance that you're looking at. Hmm. I guess this will be a shout out to all of the audience as well. If you know anyone that might be interested in participating in this type of study or any faculty grants, et cetera, that could make this happen, just let us know, <laughs> send an email or tag us on social media and maybe we can make something happen here. I think that would be really enormously interesting and hopefully it will be a great experience even for the person who's actually doing it because I think getting that kind of feedback and being able to get more information here about their own improvement process, you know, I think might be quite useful. And, and also maybe some people would enjoy the recognition because if a lot of people will now actually go and look at this video sequence that's associated with how you acquired, you know, a really an, an, an excellent skill for some medical procedure or whatever, then, you know, that may be uh, another just piece in their vita. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. That would be very interesting, I think. Now, one more topic I did want to cover before we start wrapping up the end here, since I know you're short on time, is there a lot of research for this type of study practice, like deliberate practice, for your memory skills as well, since we cover a lot of advanced accelerated learning techniques, but also mnemonics, which are becoming more popular in medical training. I know you mentioned the London taxi driver test before. Maybe some of that information and the trait versus state changes that can be seen in the mind, would you say that that also applies to memory training and mnemonics? Well, you know, just looking at the development of the memory Olympiad, or basically, you know, they have these repeated sort of international tests in memory. And if you just look at the performance of individuals who are performing in that uh, kind of group, it's amazing how their performance have increased over basically the duration of of this competition. Mm -hmm. And I think, to me, from the point of view of expertise, I think it's really important, if possible, to make that memory skill that you're developing, you know, fit the kind of demands of your future occupational tasks. So, If you're faced with diagnosis, I think it would be very important maybe to mimic the issue that you have when you're interviewing a patient, that you have to keep all these things in your head at the same time, and then being able to interrelate them and be able to rapidly see a mismatch here between, you know, basically two uh, variables or something that would then lead you to follow up asking questions about that. So basically, if that ends up now being the real bottleneck, obviously you need to be able to, you know, learn the terms and other kinds of things. But by thinking about it as now being something that will support you in doing this diagnostic task may actually influence how you want to build basically whatever memory supportive structures that, you know, you you basically want to develop. Huh. That just gave me an idea. So we have a term called an illness script that is often mentioned in medical education. And it's basically a stereotype for each disease. You have certain presentations that are most common, at least in test questions, not necessarily in clinic. 
that you get used to recognizing as a certain disease for a test question so you can answer that question properly. So maybe using that illness script for a visual mnemonic would be a good tactic to implement. Right. I mean, something that would allow you to simultaneously hold on to information and being able to relatively easily relate it to each other. So for example, we've studied chess players and and their exceptional memory is, so if you show them for five seconds a chess position from a chess game, a world-class player would be able to reproduce all the pieces. Now, it's clear that they're actually semantically encoding this because when they presented the same number of pieces, but now randomly rearranged, essentially the world-class players, you know, they were down to four or five pieces, almost like a beginner. It's kind of like they're seeing patterns. And the question is, is there a way here of supporting now the building up of that memory skill that would allow a chess player to plan out consequences of a bunch of different moves? And I guess in the case of a medical doctor, having a lot of information that's relevant now to a pathology and then being able to kind of reason about, you know, how the different pieces relate to each other and how would that memory structure be built? And I think, you know, the illness scripts would need to fit into this general model, whether in fact the illness script should be kind of the building block or something that it's just necessary that you would be able to identify within this structure that you have for representing all that information. All right. I, I'm kind of comparing the chess example, which I think uh, was quite interesting in your book, I'm the world champion, or I forget his title, one of the grandmasters that could blindfold play 30 or 40 games concomitantly. How do you remember the pieces for every move while you're playing 40 different games at the same time, whatever number it was? And I kind of make the comparison to that, to the illness scripts in the aspect that, okay, they must be recognizing certain patterns. And with the illness scripts, we recognize certain patterns. But then, like you mentioned, what happens when a chess piece is put out of place where it sort of messes up their visual representation of that pattern? In a similar fashion, if you have a odd presentation of a common disease that you're used to, that can really throw out of whack your illness script and and your pattern recognition there. So you might not recognize that disease like you normally would. And we actually did some experiments and other people have done it. So instead of actually showing the chest position at the same time, you can actually, in a random way, read out the chess square and then tell what piece is in that square. And what's interesting is that very good chess players, they have no problem actually integrating that information. But obviously, uh, less skilled players, you know, they can't even hold on to that information to be able to you know, see if there are some patterns for that particular chess position that's being presented. But I think that understanding more about what are the operations that the expert is able to do. So by basically describing now what the expert medical doctor is able to reason and then working backwards and say, you know, what are the tasks that we would be able to do that you know, would be maybe not as difficult here as a task that they would have no problems with that would actually allow you to start building that structure that then can be elaborated and eventually, you know, allow you to match the performance of the experts. So elaboration is sort of another key for expertise, it seems. Right. Kind of that idea here of sort of semantically being able to represent things in an appropriate way. And my memory is that Experts, when they actually get results numerically, they're able to transform those into more meaningful kind of quantities. But that also means that if you ask them to recall the specific number, they wouldn't be able to do that, but they don't need that in order to be able to reason about the relationship of of this type of variable and how it may or may not be relevant to ruling out diagnosis. Good point. If I hear a creatinine level that's like 2.0, I know that's elevated. I don't need to remember what number it is. I just know that it's severely elevated and sort of go from there. I know there's something with the kidney that I need to check out. So I didn't initially have this question 
for you. But listening to one of your other interviews, I found it very interesting and sort of wanted to throw it in here as well. You discussed state-dependent memory a little bit. One of the hosts brought it up on the interview. But this is a topic that I've come across a few times now specifically for testing for the board exams and maybe trying to test in less than ideal conditions in a place that's a little more distracting and noisy or something like that so that when you get to your actual board exams, you can deal with any distractions that might happen and decrease your stress level. Would you recommend something like that? Or is there any science for that? Well, for example, I remember the first time I gave a talk uh, as a postdoctoral fellow to a large conference, I kind of walked up and I remember basically starting, I had it all written out. So that was ended up being very good. But just seeing this ocean of people kind of looking at me was actually a pretty uh, intimidating experience. Now, given that I had it written down, I was able to sort of work with my written product until I felt more comfortable so I could start taking it over. But in general, I would argue that designing your training, or at least part of the training, should be focused on those performance constraints. So I know, for example, that advanced music students, when they actually practice something in the practice room, you know, there are different rules. If they make a mistake, they can just stop and then do it over. But when you're actually in front of an audience, maybe even with an orchestra, if you make a mistake, it's not like you can kind of stop and just do it over. And if you did, people would be annoyed because it would, you know, really detract from their experience of the music itself. So there are different rules for when you're actually performing in front of an audience. And skilled musicians, when they make a mistake, they can actually hide that mistake by, instead of continuing playing the way they would, they can now adjust that, which makes now the mistake that they made much less salient to anybody listening to them. Hmm. And I believe that basically training that for performing I mean, obviously, if, if you bring 500 people to listen to you every time you play, you know, it might be hard to get them back, you know, especially if you don't do so well the first couple of times. So what people actually have developed is asking just a friend or two to just sit there while they're actually now performing. And now they have this performance set so they can kind of work out all the skills that are associated with the performance part until they're actually now in front of the audience. And I think, you know, it's a little bit the same way, I guess, with taking these big tests. There's a specific time when your performance really matters. They wouldn't care here if you could tell them that you did 20% better here, you know, three days before the test. And that's part of what I think, you know, a skilled performer would be working on. And if they diagnose that this might be something that they have more problems with than other people, well, then they probably need to spend more time on it. Yeah, I can definitely see how how those differences can really be difficult to overcome sometimes and just analyzing it yourself and figuring out where the troubleshooting, where the weak point might be can be a problem. And and here again, you know, if you had a good teacher or a very experienced, say, uh, graduate student or other individual who had gone through this process, I bet you that they would be able to provide some very useful guidance if you would be able to get them to be willing to kind of monitor you when you were taking the test. And just, you know, when you take the test, being really firm here about when you do it, and it's not, you know, like you can decide when you want to do it. Basically, you should replicate those exact conditions here that you're going to take the test under. And by becoming more and more familiar with that, you're probably going to be more likely here to be able to use your time wisely here in terms of improving your score as opposed to, you know, just going and doing and then just finding out that you run out of time. That's going to be one of my next goals is working on a platform for peer tutoring in medical school. It's a little bit that exists right now, but it's mostly physicians tutoring and those can be quite pricey. So I'd love to see more of a peer tutoring aspect and people that are still learning currently, they're going to have a much different view on the material than someone that's already graduated might. So to finish up here, I usually end the segment with three questions and I've recently changed out the questions to something a little 
a little more general, uh, a little more applicable to the various guests that I have on the show. And I think it's just interesting because they're all topics that someone has, if not an expertise in, usually pretty strong opinion about. So I'm now calling this segment Just Three Wishes. The first question, if you could change one thing about your memory, what would it be? Well, that's an interesting question to me, because I think early on, I realized that I was very good at rotely memorizing things, but I just found that it seemed to be a waste of my energies once I knew what I wanted to eventually be able to be good at. So I think pretty much even in high school, I refused this idea for history exams of actually trying to cram and study dates and stuff like that. I ended up actually going to the library and reading maybe a book or two about the same period. So now I could kind of read and try to understand all the things that were going on. And then on the test, it was almost like I could retrieve all the necessary knowledge based here on my kind of understanding of the historical things. And and I think that's been a general principle of mine of knowing that I may have to spend 10 times as much time But if I try to understand why things are the way they are, I'm going to remember it much more easily. And it's also going to be much more easy for me to use that information later on, because once I understand it, it's something that I can now connect to other knowledge that I have. From that point of view, it's more like it it was kind of a switch that I had that led me now to a different conception of what it is that I should be trying to do where memory really wasn't in itself a limiting factor. All right. I couldn't agree more with finding out why you need to learn information. That's a trouble I know I've had, and I'm sure most medical students with, we're not taught why we need to know certain facts. And it becomes very difficult to motivate yourself to remember them. And usually in that case, you have to memorize them since conceptually, it doesn't make as much sense to do so. For the uh, second question here, if you could change one thing in education, what would it be? I've been trying in the last uh, few years, you know, to try to see here how our insights into experts might have some relevance here for more general education. And, and, I, and I guess I, I feel that, you know, our society has changed tremendously. And, and I think the kinds of skills and qualities that you would need maybe now and, and especially decades from now it's going to be, you're going to need to be able to relearn and be very adaptive. So what you really want to do is to help students become entrepreneurial. So they, in some ways, are developing the skills to be able to be good, not at basically just resuscitating the information that basically their teachers gave them, but in a sense here, developing individuals who are willing to think and basically also having kind of a goal where, you know, they can, you know, be motivated here to kind of improve their performance, seeing that, you know, not only will they feel good about doing well, but actually, as especially as a doctor, if, if you can do something for your patients that would in some ways make the outcomes better for them, just because it's you, I think that would be extremely rewarding and, and sort of really motivate me if I was a doctor to invest here and really trying to be doing a little bit better every year. Yeah, great point. I notice in a lot of realms of education, not just medical education, it's difficult for the educators to keep up with the education research, with the psychology of learning and cognitive science of it. So hopefully some of these shows will tell the audience, whether it be educators or students, what the current research says and how to best benefit their own studies just in case they might not have heard it elsewhere. Well, you know, I think that would be wonderful. All right. The last question, if there's one thing you could change in medicine, what would it be? I think when it comes to that idea of professional development beyond sort of the more formal training and finding and providing tools now for medical doctors, nurses, and anybody involved here in the treatment of patients, of giving them the tools to kind of improve and in some ways make sort of their job richer and more challenging. Because I I think that I've seen, you know, cases where people feel like they're just doing things over and over. Although maybe medicine is a place here where there's more people who seem to be really caring 
you know, and, and really getting something out of establishing that contact with the patients and thereby getting enjoyment when they feel that they can be really helpful and making a difference in people's lives. But the more that you would be able to provide these kinds of tools and, and maybe even create time in the, in the same way that certain jobs, it's really you have a big chunk of time and maybe it could only be half an hour a day or whatever where you actually challenge yourself. And in a sense, you're having the sense that you're now able to do certain kinds of difficult and challenging things better or preparing for you know, a really adverse event that may or may not happen. But if it did, you could potentially now make the difference between life and death for a given patient. Wow, when you put it uh, like that, difference in life and death, I think everyone should consider putting a little more time into that personal development and personal training then. And again here, I think you're the new generation here that hopefully will you know, be able to uh, find some of these ways here in which things could be improved both for you know, the, the professionals as well and then indirectly for the patients. I sure hope so. Are there any parting words or places that the audience can contact you? I'm kind of uh, almost not being able to handle my email. So, so basically, uh, I don't have a lot of this sort of social presence. But I would encourage people, if they're interested in what you were talking about before, and if it ends up being something that you would be interested in, I certainly would be willing to do my best here to support something like that. And I think that would be really exciting. Definitely. I've always been interested in research as well. So I think uh, any opportunity in there, I will definitely try to fit into my schedule. Well, Dr. Anders Eriksson, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you and uh, best of luck here making uh, these uh, important changes. (laughs) Thank you very much. Have a good one. I'd like to give one last thank you to Dr. Erickson for sharing his insights into mastering your medical studies. Go to our bit.ly link at bit.ly slash ITV community to join our Slack community channel. Here you can reach us, ask questions, leave feedback, and communicate with others in the Inside the Boards community. For those that wish to become a part of ITV but don't have the time to be directly affiliated, just join the conversation and make some future requests via our Slack channel. This is available on mobile and desktop via our bit.ly link at bit.ly slash ITB community. Again, that's bit.ly slash ITB community. Well, I hope to see you there.